Recording in progress. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our continued conversation about assets and bases. We've left off discussing whether or not we can describe an asset as strong or weak, same going for a base. And we arrived at the conclusion that the strength of an asset or base depends on the degree of dissociation. So if we're going to talk about like the degree of dissociation or quantifying some kind of dissociation equilibrium, then we need to consider what's going on when acids and bases are dissociating into their components in solutions surrounded by water in that dissociation equilibrium state. So let's jump in. So kind of a refresher. Recall, we expect some acid HA to dissociate in solution and generate what we've been calling acid particles, acidic protons, hydrogen ions. The same goes for base. Except we expect bases to generate hydroxide ions when they dissociate in solution. I keep specifying in solution reminding us this is happening in the beaker because the surrounding environment in the solution, meaning what these acid and base molecules exist in, is important in talking about how they dissociate. So in solution, the acid and or base is surrounded by water, which means that water is actually gonna be like pretty involved, like a critical component in the dissociation of acids and bases. So let's look at some general acid dissociation in water where the general acid I'm going to write as HA. So we've got to imagine that we've got a bunch of acid molecules and they are in solution surrounded by a huge excess of liquid water. Why is this important to consider when thinking about how this acid is going to dissociate? Before, when we were talking about acid dissociation, we presumed that there would be free protons or free hydrogen ions that are kind of like floating around solution. And if we think about this practically, it doesn't necessarily make sense that we would have these like free moving protons that exist throughout our acidic solution. Because remember, protons are pretty strongly charged, right? They carry the same amount of charge as an electron. So there's got to be some kind of like ion dipole interaction that exists between our water and that free proton. So what we're doing now is we're like kind of zooming in at the true molecular level of what's happening with acid dissociation and thinking about, okay, I can't just ignore the fact that there's a bunch of water around there. So what does the water do? So let's think about this. In this dissociation equilibrium, the involvement that we see from our water means that there's actually some kind of acid-base reaction that occurs between either our acid and the water and the base and our water that has been dissolved. So for example, in the case of HA, we know according to the Bronsted-Lowry definition that this is an acid because it will donate 
H plus to something else in reaction. So instead of thinking about free H pluses being generated from the dissociation, we're going to think about that H plus made from dissociation actually being given to something else. And in this place, in this case, excuse me, it is going to be donated to the water molecules. So we will now have this protonated product H3O plus, so that's water with an additional H plus ion, leaving behind anion A minus, where for our purposes now, this ion, the hydronium ion, this is what we're going to replace with like all our mention of acidic particles. So like my point here is we know that there cannot be free H plus or free protons existing in solution because that proton is donated to surrounding water, which then creates hydronium ion in solution. So the hydronium ion is our new acidic particle. So when we start talking about pH, we start talking about like how acidic a solution is, it's all going to be relative to how much of this acidic substance, hydronium, is made. So that is for some general acid. What if we had some general base? And I am going to keep this base dissociation truly very generalized. I'm not going to presume that my base even contains hydroxide because the thing about weak bases that's kind of interesting is they actually don't need to have a hydroxide ion in their composition to contribute hydroxide to solution. So let's look at an example in the general case to prove how that could happen. Let's suppose we have some base B that is surrounded in solution by a bunch of water molecules. According to the Ronson-Lowry definition, we know that this base needs to accept some H plus from something. And the question is from what, right? In solution, I've just got my base molecules and then the surrounding water molecules. So because water contains hydrogen and is the only substance available to act as a proton donor or a Bronsted-Lowry acid in this example, then what that means is the protonation of our base, BH+, plus, is, as is gonna be coming as a result of the water donating a proton to that base. So BH plus, because H plus was donated from the water to B. Now, what's left with water, right? So water, if you'd like, I like to think of this as HOH sometimes. So for us in this case, this is the acidic H that has been donated to our base, this leaves behind our basic hydroxide particle, and it is through this interaction with water that we understand how a base, even one not containing hydroxide itself, can undergo some dissociation and solution to generate hydroxide or increase the amount of hydroxide present in the flask or in the beaker which makes it an Arrhenius base. So these are some generalized equations. All you would need to do if you were given some acid is replace this and this, or if you were given some base, replace this and this. And again, these are all assuming that these are some kind of Bronsted Lowry, reactions that are occurring with our acidic and our basic substances in solution, meaning 
in water or with water. Now take note here, we left off describing the strength of acids and bases. Like what does that have to do with these dissociation equilibria? Well, remember how much your equilibrium favors the dissociation into either our acidic or basic ions determines what we call your acidic or basic strength, right? Like you're a strong acid if your equilibrium favors dissociation and you're a strong base if your favors the dissociation to make hydroxide. So if we're going to be talking about strong, weak, et cetera, acids and bases, then we need to describe this dissociation equilibrium. And the way that we describe equilibria in general is by using what we have been talking about for a while now, some kind of equilibrium constant. So let's start by talking about the equilibrium constant for some acid. So I'm gonna rewrite our general acid dissociation equation. So I've got acid in the presence of water in solution that establishes a dissociation equilibrium to form the acidic hydronium ion and the leftover anion, A minus. If I wanted to craft a Ka or a K expression, let's not give away the whole story yet. K expression, it's like Kc. This would be concentration of products raised to their coefficients over concentration of reactants raised to their coefficients. And it would not include any of our condensed phase substances because those things, one, can't really be described by a molarity and two, generally have a very negligible change in their quantity over the course of a reaction time. So then how would this work for this reaction? So I would have now my dissociation products, hydronium and anion concentrations over my concentration of my molecular or undissociated acid HA. And since this is an equilibrium constant, all of these concentrations are concentrations at equilibrium. Now, we don't call this Kc anymore. In fact, we have a special subscript for this particular K constant. So this is called the acid dissociation constant. K sub A. And again, for some general acid HA, we would expect this to have the form Ka is equal to the concentration of our dissociation products. So that's our acidic hydronium and anion over the concentration of molecular acid HA. So this is the same deal that we've been talking about when it comes to equilibrium constants, right? Same structure, same format, same idea. It describes our proportion of our substances in the reaction va uh, vessel at equilibrium. It's just now that we're looking at acid dissociation, the reaction we're considering is going to be the equilibrium established when this molecular acid undergoes a ronsted lowry interaction with water to create the dissociation products H3O plus and A minus. All right, so we've got 
acid dissociation constant, Ka here. And this is for, again, some general acid HA. So let's practice using HA or thinking about HA. In this example, I have given us two different acids. So we've got hydrofluoric acid with its Ka given is 6.8 times 10 to the negative four. And perchlorous acid, which has a Ka of 2.9 times 10 to the negative eight. I am asking us to make a claim about the strength of each acid and to maybe back that claim up with a little bit of proof. So which acid is stronger? What do we predict? So recall that the larger that K is, then that must mean that the reaction favors the products at equilibrium, AKA the concentration of products at equilibrium has to be greater than the concentration of reactants at equilibrium. So in our case, where we're looking at some general dissociation for weak acids, like so, we have to ask ourselves which one of these given weak acids are going to have the most dissociation favored reactions. So we're comparing their K constants. So we would probably predict that the acid with the larger Ka is stronger. So in this case, if we're looking at hydrofluoric, 6.8 times 10 to the negative four, and perchlorous acid, 2.9 times 10 to the negative eight, 10 to the negative eight is super tiny, 10 to the negative four is tiny, but less so. So we would probably predict HF to be stronger than HClO. So this is our prediction. And let's find a way to justify this, right? So like we're crafting a, an argument here. We know generally that the larger the K, the more that our equilibrium has a favor of the products or a higher concentration of products at equilibrium relative to that of reactant. And based on that knowledge alone, we should predict that stronger acids have higher Ka's. Let's see if we can't make an example or two to like prove this. So what if we consider a 1.0 molar solution of both hydrofluoric and perchlorous acid. So we've got one more solutions of each, which has the larger hydronium ion concentration or acid particle concentration once each of these have undergone their own dissociation equilibrium. So this is our justification. And let's really look at what we're kind of demanding of ourselves to make this argument something that is justifiable. One molar solutions of each, and we want to know the amount of this at equilibrium. So anytime we're trying to find something at equilibrium, that generally indicates we need to figure out what's happening from an initial concentration to the concentrations at equilibrium by using an ice table. 
So let's write out the dissociations of both HF and HClO. So I've got HF aqueous plus H2O. These are acids, so the HF is going to donate its proton to the H2O. That's going to create our acidic hydronium, leaving behind fluoride ion. And then for the perchlorous acid, we have HClO plus H2O, establishing a dissociation equilibrium to create the hydronium acid particle, hydronium ion, leaving behind the perchloride ion. Nope, that's per chlorate, there we go. And now we've got to do an ice table for each. So we've set up a scenario where we have 0.1 molar of our yet undissociated weak acids here. Remember water, we just don't consider it all in any of our equilibrium treatments because again, water is a pure liquid and those condensed phases are not given or shown or they do not appear in our equilibrium constant. And pre-dissociation, we know that the concentrations of hydronium and the anion from our acid is zero molar. Okay, all of these associations look like they're one-to-one. -one. So I know that for every decrease in the concentration of molecular hydrofluoric acid, X, there is a proportional increase in the amount of hydronium and fluoride ion same x, which means that equilibrium, I've got 1.0 minus x molar, and then x and x molar for each of these substances. And I can do the same kind of treatment for my HClO. So this becomes 1.0 minus x molar, x molar, and x molar. And now we can set up our Ka expressions. So let's look for the Ka for HF. So HF has a Ka of 6.8 times 10 to the negative four. So we have 6.8 times 10 to the negative four is equal to X squared, because that is concentration this times concentration this at equilibrium, which is X over molecular HF at equilibrium, which is one minus X. Okay, this is gonna require us to do some algebra. So moving over our denominator, 6.8 times 10 to the negative four minus 6.8 times 10 to the negative four X is equal to X squared or X squared plus 6.8 times 10 to the negative four plus 6.8 times 10 to the negative four is equal to zero. And we need to solve with the quadratic formula because 10 to the negative four, albeit small, is not quite small enough for the small x approximation. And then looking at our HClO, this has a Ka of 2.9 times 10 to the negative eight. So I will put my acid dissociation constant expression together. 2.9 times 10 to the negative eight is equal to my concentration of hydronium 
at equilibrium times my concentration of my other dissociation product at equilibrium. So that's X squared over 1.0 minus X. If we look at the order of magnitude here in this solution, this is a very, very small dissociation constant. So we are going to approximate that this is equal to zero. So we're applying our small x approximation. Which means that x is equal to the square root of 2.9 times 10 to the negative eight. And if you were to take your own time to solve either the quadratic formula and get a value for X, we would find the respective H3O plus concentrations at equilibrium. And then we would compare them. So I recommend that you finish up this example just to make sure you're, you know, lightning quick at doing these quadratic formula solutions. Um, make sure that you're totally comfortable with why we were able to apply the small x approximation here for HCLO. And in our next video, we are going to look at the flip side of these weak dissociation processes. So instead of looking just at a weak acid dissociation and the constant that describes that dissociation. We will look at the weak base dissociation and the constant that describes that equilibrium. And once we have those tools, we will be able to talk about the pH scale. So we'll see you on our next video where we talk about weak acid dissociation equilibrium and pH coming right up.